right? It has just been, you know, um, uh, maybe a typical college transition for her with that. And I look at this and I'm like, wow, you know, this overwhelms me. Look at it through the eyes of, you know, a first time undergraduate student or a new grad student, you know, who's coming here or someone who's in the United States for the first time, you know, to take classes, you know, and this is overwhelming, right? But again, I want to stress well-intentioned, well-meaning, because this was not put up as a negative thing yesterday. This was put up as a positive graphic. It is positive that we have all these people on campus to support our students. But, you know, kind of the purpose of this session is to talk about how all of these groups on the outside of the circle can work together so that student doesn't have to reach out to 8, 10, 12 different offices. Yes. All right. So today's agenda, we're going to go through, we did the introductions. So we're going to do um, a little discussion of some guiding questions. What guided us to be here today? Um, then we're going to go over a few systems. Now, we're going to go over a few systems that we use. There may be systems that you all use that are not here. But again, we want to talk about the systems that we use and how we utilize those to actually engender student success here at AU. Then we're gonna go through some case studies. Okay, I think the, the best way, and we thought about the best way for us to actually have this conversation is to actually have, have you dial into some case studies. So we'll give you a couple of case studies. They're gonna be real simple. They're not gonna be complex. This is not a test. We're not gonna grade anyone, but we're gonna talk about what would you do? The students before you, this is what's going on. What would you do? And what systems would you utilize to assist the students to make sure that they can navigate successfully through AU and be satisfied once they leave your office? Then we'll go back and talk about some wish lists. So we know that we're moving into a workday environment. So let's talk about the wish list. We're going to talk about our systems and how we utilize them, but maybe wish lists. What do we wish we have access to that will allow us to help the students in those situations? And then we'll close out and have some more discussion. So when um, Janice, Rachel, and I got together and started planning this session, you know, we went into it with, uh, okay, technology, how can we get technology to work for us? Um, but as you can, as we've already demonstrated this morning, that, you know, technology is not our strong suit. <laughs> so that's what, so, but that's what, and that's fine, but that's what we work here because we um, like students, you know, and I jotted down something that President Alger said yesterday, personal touch and relationships matter. All right, so that's kind of our guiding principle with this, just say, you know, how we can use technology to help us with that personal touch and personal relationships with students, how we can work with each other um, to, you know, really improve that student experience. Okay, so we're gonna start with a little bit of group engagement. We're, we all teach AUX, and so we were not about to, to walk into this room without doing some sort of um, collaborative activity. So if you'd be willing to pull out a technological device um, and, and answer this question for us to get us started here. Tell us about your experiences using technology systems at AU. We just wanna get a sense of how people are feeling, where they're coming in um, to the space today. And if this works, this is my first time embedding Mentimeter into PowerPoint. So you're going to help me um, figure out whether or not this is a functional tool or I use it functionally. So the first question, how comfortable do you... It, it's on a scale of, of one to five. Oh, of course. Nine, three, three, six, two, zero, five, nine. I'm sorry about that. No. That is coming up. We're foreshadowing here for us. Okay, so the first question, how comfortable do you feel navigating AU's technology systems? And then the second question in pink here, 
Um, in general, how well do you feel the AU community collaborates through technology? Is there on scales of one to five, one being the least comfortable um, and five being most comfortable or collaborates the best? Correct. Yes, yeah. so about 13 people at four, which is putting us at our average here. Um, so it looks like we're relatively comfortable navigating a used technology systems, um, but less confident in, in or I guess less confident in our the ways that the community collaborates through technology. Does anyone speak to that? And online too, I will invite you in. I've got the chat pulled up here. Yes. Uh, I'll just say the, the CRM is not functional right now for grad advisors, so there's not, I think maybe some of the stuff you guys are going to share that is working for you, and I'm looking forward to hearing that, is not yet functional. So for, so, for us. So grad least. advisors are not part of the CRM advice? I'm not, they, the system is set up, but it's not set up like uh, the correct students are not fully in there right now. There's okay. no dashboards, I see no None of my students, it's not functional. Okay, Mary, how long have you worked here? Two years. Okay. A little over two years. Okay, so we're hearing in the room that um, CRM Advise, which is a tool that we're going to talk quite a bit about that we rely on heavily um, through undergraduate advising, is not functional on the graduate advising side. Correct. I see a few hands. Yeah. Alyssa, yeah. It's, it's, in, it's in progress, it's it sounds like. Okay. And even on the undergrad side, it's not updated. Like it's updated. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's going to On the undergraduate side, updates are <laughs> inconsistent and unpredictable. Um, so I answered two on the second question, and I don't think it's necessarily the fault that people use the technology. Um, the challenges I've often felt with the same technology is one, we invest in entirely too many different products. Mm -hmm. So we identify one problem, we buy a whole product to fix that one problem. Yeah. Another problem, another product, another problem, another product. And so all of a sudden, one person's job is to sell mm -hmm. seven different products. When one of those products probably could address four or five that we had actually have invested in. Mm -hmm. So now, and I imagine a lot of the challenges we get to talk about and think to create the paper today is just the, the idea of bouncing around. And then I think to, to Mary's point, the, the second thing is once we invest in things, it's not converted to that point. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the registrar's office. I feel like 99% of my work is in service now, that is speaking to my colleagues, and service now is not used by every office on campus. So, you know, sometimes I'm in the student who has a registrar who could also be used in another office, and then I'm all the best I can do is like close out the case to that office to be like, you know, now that you're, you know, uh, doing what I can, but like now, you know, cash is on the queue, but it's not living service now anymore, and all that tractability, all that kind of stuff, and that history is now like gone. Yes. Um, so that was why I was doing the second part. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So a quick, a uh, quick summary from the room here. Um, a colleague responded to um, the second question with a two, and reflecting on the fact that this isn't necessarily. Uh, a fault of the people doing the work, but rather that there's too many systems to navigate um, that that all house different information and don't necessarily speak to one another. Is that a fair fair summary? Um, I, Tara, I think you had your hand up a while back. No, okay, okay. <laughs> Some enthusiastic agreement from the from the the room here. Um, any other thoughts? We're going to talk more about service now. You know, that's one of the, the, <laughs> the some of the technology we're going to talk about. So, David. All right, we've, we've stepped into this a little bit, but now we'd like to unpack a little bit more um, in thinking about what are the technological barriers to supporting students at AU? I got the same as the last one. Okay, try to refresh now if I start if I start it here. Did that help? Okay, thank you. Um, if you're logging in from menti.com, the code is 93362059. Right, so there's comments about CRM again. 
um, not updating, not, not being set up for certain populations, systems don't talk to each other, too many systems, systems don't coordinate with each other, too many systems, lack of training on the systems, lack of training again, yes. That's great. Okay. Right, and maybe not anything that we haven't heard before, right? But, you know, multiple systems, lack of training in them, turnover, you don't know what systems you're supposed to use. Um, and you've got to go to multiple systems to kind of get a full picture of what's going on with the student. Is that accurate? Anyone want to share more about, about that? And right then we're going to get into this with our scenarios also, where we're hoping that you look and tell us how you answer these student inquiries. Yes. About lost. Yes. Systems say different things. All right. So. All right, so a comment in the room about systems not having the same information, particularly BI reports, which may have different information that, that is viewed elsewhere. All right, so this is me. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Rachel, we're gonna do just a brief overview of just a couple systems. I mean, we already heard BI mentioned, you know, <laughs> so that's what. So we're gonna just do a little overview of a couple of the systems that we know that are used, you know, across campus. And then we're gonna get into our scenario. So Rachel, what do we gotta start off with? So the reason we chose these is because these are the ones that I operate in most often daily. I'm in these two systems. Um, and I want to preface that we will co constantly be disclaiming that we are not the experts in these systems. And um, there's a lot of functionalities that I'm probably missing and don't realize that these um, systems do or to Mary's point, like the systems might do, but it's not applicable or accessible to your students. Um, so we're going to set the frame for just some common terminology for each of these systems before we move into the case studies where we can talk about how we use these um, and can maximize like our overlap in, in the functionalities of the systems. So the first um, platform that I hang out in a lot is CRM Advise. Um, it's essentially a record management system. It provides a holistic view of the student experience. So I'll log into CRM to document advising appointment notes, um, to check a student's GPA or academic um, standing. But to Anna Maria's point, it's not always, and, and Alyssa's point as well, it's not always synced up. So I usually have to cross-reference that with two or three places um, to make sure it's accurate. We can track and send email interactions in CRM um, and, and review just a lot of additional information that informs the student's progression through um, their academic plan and progress. And then the second platform that I use a lot is Colleague, um, which I was trying to find a, a definition of Colleague and I think came to the conclusion that it's also a records, a, a customer, you know, student records management system, which kind of got me thinking, okay, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, why? And so it, it kind of purposefully mirrors the CRM advice um, description in my mind for my experience. Um, but I, I use this for more, uh, like active measures. Like if I need to um, manage a student's registration needs, we can process waivers and and wait lists or see wait lists, things of that nature in, in CR in colleague. Um, I can see their application information or their transfer credit uh, transcripts, things of that nature. We can change majors, change their advisor in colleague um, and process degree audits, which we admittedly do not do a lot in first year advising, but um, know that that is a, a functionality that exists. Right, and then, well, actually, the one that I'm most familiar with, and David, you had mentioned this, is ServiceNow. How many people use ServiceNow? Right, so again, about half the room um, in here. Can you can I get a virtual show of hands um, online if people use ServiceNow? All right. So ServiceNow is another customer relationship management software that the university has. Um, the office that I work in, AU Central uses it, the help desk uses it. There are a number of student facing offices around campus that also use it. The health center, uh, 
the what, and yeah housing and dining that's right so those are you know the big ones that you know as far as when students have questions and write them registrar student accounts financial aid you know are also you know big as far as utilizing service now academic advising community does not right so that's one wish that i would have because i find it a way that we can really communicate with each other rather than just referring a student back to someplace else to get their issues off, which it'll be interesting again to see what you all do with the scenarios, you know, what we, how we do our day to day business, you know, with the systems that we have. But ServiceNow, if a student contacts us, um, it automatically creates a record for them. So that's what, so we know if they've contacted us before, we can see the history of it, we can see what other people have done, we can see if they're contacting us and five other offices at the same time with this question. So all that information is in there. We at AU Central keep track of every single chat, walk-in, email, and phone call that we get from students and parents, every customer that we have. So all of that is tracked into this system. And we found it hugely helpful to be able to you know, see that information. Um, that's the one great benefit. The other thing is, is that if we get a question that we don't know the answer to, rather than just referring them, we can route it over to another office, as David alluded to earlier, and get them to either answer it or provide us the information, right? We get a lot of questions from parents. You know, the Parent and Family Engagement Office gets questions from parents about things that are related to their bill or advising or house center or whatever. So they can, you know, use that also to get it to other places. So I find that to be a really useful um, tool uh, to use. The other one is Canvas. You know, I know we have instructors and professors who are um, in these sessions as well, but Canvas is what is used in the classroom, right? So this is another thing that students are seeing and they're getting messages from. Um, you know, they obviously go in and look and see their grades and submit their assignments, uh, um, see the syllabus, see what's going on in each week in class. But that's another big one that I didn't want to forget because while we may not see that so often, students see that every day, right? So that's what keeping in mind how students are being communicated um, towards, right? And I'm not even gonna attempt in, in this environment right now to change a screen and show you something. <laughs> but so one of the nice things about ServiceNow, and I wanted to share this with the audience that we have right now, how many people are familiar with help.american.edu, right? So it is a great underutilized website that all the different offices on campus have provided information to. If you go to help.american.edu, it will immediately ask you to log in. You log in with your AU credentials, whether you're a staff member, a student, faculty member, a parent who has created an account, and you log in and it says, welcome, Gene, how can I help you? Right, And all the information is there. So you can type in something like health insurance waiver or financial aid appeal, and it will bring you to an up-to-date knowledge article with instructions on how to complete that task, information on it, and a link to do it if it is a task that needs to be done. So that is awesome. I mean, how many of you have ever heard from parents or students who are having trouble navigating our website because they go to American.edu and type in something and a ton of unnecessary stuff comes up. Our, our website is, is pretty difficult to navigate when you use the search feature in there. No offense to anyone on OIT or web development. Um, but the other nice thing about help.american.edu, when you go in and log in, you click on the top, you can check on the status of any of your requests that you have made. Right. So that's what a lot of people don't know that. And you probably see this in your own jobs as well, where someone will send you a student will send you a question in an email. And then a couple days later or a couple hours later, they will send a follow up and say, what's going on with this? With help.american.edu, once you log in, you click on the top, click on the button that says my requests. And it will show you all of your emails to offices that use service now. Okay, so you bring that up and then you can see, like if I send an email to SOC, SOC advising, and I wanna see what the status of it is, I can log in, click on my requests, and I can see that it's been assigned to Tara, right? So then I don't have to just send another email. I can communicate with Tara 
directly from that site. I can type a message. Hey, I see this inquiry has been assigned to you. Can I get an update? And Tara will get an update, even though she's not on service now, you will get an update of that. And then you can reply in there. So that is really, that is an underutilized tool that we have right there. You know, that'll cut down on the number of emails because that shows you're not just emailing into the oblivion, you're emailing to a person who is there with the case who's working it for you. Okay, so you may have that experience with the help desk. The help desk is, you know, one of the first users of ServiceNow. AU Central is a huge user of it because we get this a ton of inquiries and it's a great way to manage uh, that. So I wish the entire university was on there. I know we're looking at other things. I know there's a cost involved with licenses, but it is such a good tool um, for students to use. Michael, did I see you start to make a comment? <laughs> okay, Michael Honeycutt from the Registrar just let out a huge sigh. So, <laughs> all right. So, all right. And then Workday, right? TBD, right? So, with all of this, we've got, we, we didn't even talk about all the systems. You know, we don't know um, BI. I mean, obviously, we don't use BI. I've heard about BI since I worked at AU Central, but it's it's overwhelming, you know, with that. But that's another system, you know, but now we are moving to a totally new system, which is going to replace colleague. So this is our opportunity to um, say what we want, right? We're all going to be at meetings and we're going to talk about that and get your suggestions at the end. But, you know, let's not let this opportunity pass um, to say what we want. I will say that when I, AU was my first job out of college, I haven't worked here continuously, but it was my first job out of college. And I was working in um, enrollment services, Michael remembers, because we were here together. Uh, and at that time is when the, the university switched to college, right? And we had a whole bunch of meetings and we planned it, you know, planned it out, you know, built it just the way we wanted it. And now, you know, it's no longer meeting our, our needs, you know, so that's what. So now we've got the opportunity to do a fresh again with this new, yeah, Michael. Um, to sidebar, uh, Dana and I sort of attended a uh, meeting with a uh, registrar at the uh, university. This was just even the team in the spring 24 work day meeting that customized. And if you talk about what the future looks like, I think you say the economy is going to kill us, right? Okay. If you, can, if you can imagine, like, the trends that are brought up here to free audit. And it was like the strength to keep the source according to the requirements. Mm -hmm. Yes, and like almost like a magic for those who see the eye, the eye will work, and you can see your work. <laughs> like, that's the way I can sort of see my every yes. It helps the minute, and you know. So, yeah, we're, we're quite All right. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase it. So it's Michael and David from the registrar's office who have seen, you know, what the, some of the potential uh, work day is going to be. And to paraphrase, the future is so bright, you got to wear shades. Right? <laughs> Anybody? Is that is that a reference that anyone gets? All right. Thank you, Ashley. So that's what. So, yeah. So that's what. So that's promising. Right. We do not want to spend millions and millions of dollars on something that is not going to be better than what we have. That's not going to work and correct some of the problems that we have in doing our job. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. So, wow. All I can say is, wow. Um, as for being here one year, wow. Um, so we talked about four, four systems that we use and BI is another one um, that's out there, but I'm sure there are others out there that individuals use at the university um, that help. So think about a student. Right. Think about a student who comes into your office and you're trying to find all this information. And I know most of us have at least two screens. I have three and I have a fourth because I bring my laptop. So I have to kind of work around that. So imagine a student. Right. So we're talking about student success and how do we help them? So the next session is we're going to talk about what would we do. Right. So when we look at our systems, um, the systems that we use occasionally, the systems that we use all the time, we kind of know the ins and outs, right? Some of us have um, our little, Rachel has been great with showing me the little things that you can do to kind of shortcut the system. But what we want to do is be able to support the students when they come into the office, they can leave with a resolution, right? They don't leave with more questions. So what we want to do is get to a point where we're going to do the case study. So the question is, what would you do? 
student knocks on your door and they have these scenarios, what would you do? So here are, we're gonna pass out the scenarios to each desk. Um, I think we're going to, for those of you online, we're gonna put you in breakout rooms, but let me just go through the questions for the scenario, the case study. So when you get your case study, the questions are, what questions do you ask the student? The student comes in your office, what do you ask the student? Because again, we have all these systems. Right, so we the student's going to tell you stuff. So now you have to figure out which system to use um, to gather the information. What other offices do you contact? Jean mentioned the help. Maybe you don't have to contact anyone. Maybe you just type it in. Um, do how do these contact? How do you contact these offices? You send an email, and what follow up would you do if anything to make sure that there's completion and satisfaction for the student? Right. So so that. So those of you online, we'll put you in the breakout room shortly. So let me just go through these scenarios, okay? So one, we have scenario case study one. Rebecca, an incoming first year student, has submitted an accommodations request through ASAC. Her request was granted and Rebecca was provided with a letter to share as she pleases with her faculty. During the fall semester, after sharing her accommodations letter with faculty, Rebecca received an additional notice an additional diagnosis associated with her previous condition. Rebecca did not update ASAC regarding the, her new medical diagnosis, and thus no additional accommodations was granted for the spring semester. At the end of April, Rebecca realized that her medical condition impeded her academic performance and is now in your office. I don't know who has that one, but that's an interesting one, okay? So case study number two. Sandra is an incoming first year student. Again, two first year people up here, right? <laughs> um, she has been told her file is missing information and she cannot register for classes. Her fall schedule shows she is only enrolled in Core 100. What do you do? Um, two more. Third case study. A continuing graduate student contacts you regarding the fall 2024 semester. This is a combination there is a combination of Fs and Fxs on the academic record. And the student says a medical issue caused them to do poorly. What do you do? And lastly, <laughs> a transfer student is approaching graduation and realizes that some of their credits are not articulated and their graduation will be extended a semester. What do you do? Uh, so I want to say one thing uh, before we start working on this. So as we were thinking about these scenarios, you know, we wanted them to be, you know, true. You know, some of these are true, you know, and inclusive of the different types of students that we have. Once I, once we were putting these together, I had just gotten off the phone with the, with a mom of a continuing undergraduate and she, the daughter had gone through um, a VPAC appeal process, right? So I think everyone is familiar with that. Uh, so, and she was contacting because the daughter had left. She's back now, she's better. She'd gotten the help that she needed and she's ready to start in the fall, right? But the, there's money on the account. She owes money on her bill and she can't register. So it, she, her question to me was, this should have been taken care of. My VPAC appeal was approved, right? So that is a pretty common question that we get in AU Central. You may have it as well. You may refer them to us. So I just give this example before we go and start working on the scenarios is, you know, with the, what the issue with this is the VPAC appeal was approved. All the tuition was taken off the account for the semester, but there was a housing charge, a meal plan charge and health insurance. So this was for last fall. So I checked with housing and it was a legitimate charge. She did not move out until very late in the semester. Check dining, meals had been used. It was a legitimate charge. I knew from health insurance that as a policy, we do not remove health insurance as part of the VPAC petition. So that $10,000 charge was legitimate. So I say this not to say someone should have told her, I'm sure that this information was conveyed. You know, that's a, one of the things that I try to think of and remember when I'm communicating with students is if someone's not understanding what you were saying, you need to figure out a different way to say it. Right, so that's what. No, I, I think you brought up a great example. It would have not been communicated by the academic units because we don't see that information. 
Okay, so, and then th there's an issue. So someone was saying that we would not have communicated that information. So there is an, an issue, you know, with that. It's just like, oh, everything's going to be taken care of. I, what I don't want is for people, you know, we're all well-intentioned and doing the best of our jobs, right? And that's what I want to see from your scenarios, what you do with, with that question, or do you even consider it if it's outside of your scope there? Because students are suffering as a result of that. So how can we be better um, with solving these, these issues with that? So unfortunately, you know, as you can imagine, the mom is worried about her daughter. It's a relief that that huge tuition charge is taken off her account. But now a week before classes start, she's got to come up with $10,000 in order for her kid to return. And again, it's legitimate. She used the resources, right? It's not as if she didn't live in the residence hall or eat the meal. It's legitimate. But here we are, you know, a week before classes start. So it, it ties to everything. It ties to retention. You know, is this going to be a student who's able to register for fall? She's not registered yet. She wants to be. She's ready. We want her to register. We want her to graduate. So what can we do? You know, so it's students like that that tend to get lost like that. And a plug for our office at AU Central. If you have students like that, we are a place to send them to, you know, with that. We have, I think, more than... A lot of offices on campus, a more global picture of the student situation, all right? So, all right, so let's go to this scenario. We get them up at the breakout rooms and you all can just talk in your groups. Uh, the questions to consider are on the sheet. I did, the printer printed it out, double-sided for me, but your scenario was just on the front. Okay. Yes. Yeah. are closed everyone's back in the main room now so let's go through we're gonna hear what you all had to say about these scenarios we'll ask that people um joining us virtually will type some comments uh, in the chat, and we'll share those as we go through each of the four scenarios, right? So again, we just want to get kind of a, a general idea, you know, of this. So let's start with this back table. You had scenario number one. All right, so they're up on the screen. If anyone needs to refresh their memory, lots of detail in scenario number one. So what do you do? So, um, one of the things we talked about is um, that it's important for us to understand the accommodation process and know that Accommodations are contract preemptive, mm -hmm. do not apply into the past. Mm -hmm. And so while that procedure may sure just happen, we need to consult it in our work with the students to figure out what went wrong and how can it be fixed for the future. Okay. Um, one thing we would ask the student is what their closing preparation should be, because there's some things that could be resolved, but their hope is that they get um So a couple questions. How do you know, uh, how do you confirm that this student has accommodations? You just take their word for it. Is there some place in a CRM advise that you do? Do you call Lindsay? How do you confirm that a student has accommodations? So generally, um, that's So if you were to contact 
um, disability office, disability support services, ASAC, um, how would you contact them? And this is, I'm talking to you, Alyssa, but it's anyone at your, at your table or anyone in the room, really, or online. Okay. Did anyone get information about the new portal that's going to be going into effect? Um, in this session, it is dawning on me that the pool advisory community does not know about this new portal. <laughs> yeah, so I got an email yesterday as an adjunct instructor telling me about it. So that's what, so that's, you know, from School of Education. So again, that, that's ASAC looking to do something differently with that. As instructors, you know, we, you know, students will often come and give us a letter at, or email us a letter at the start of the semester. Again, I'm just you know, this is no right or wrong, just like, what would you do? So generally you assume that if the student says they have accommodations that they have, you don't have a particular contact person in ASAC, you would send them over, right? Anything to add, you know, with this, anything differently? I guess I just, uh, I would say that we're, we're, I mean, accommodations are a student's private information. So even as their advisor, we shouldn't be speaking to confirm that or okay. not it's their private information and only handled with the office that handles that. Okay, and that's fair. And that's probably the correct thing to do is, so if there's a particular office, because we'll hear a lot about this, you know, going back to that initial circle with all these offices, you know, especially someone who has accommodations who might already have an issue with processing a lot of information, you know, depending on what the accommodations are for, would that make a difference? Are you going to say, go to ASAC and, you know, this is where their office is. This is what, you know, I'm trying to look at what we are going to do as far as, you know, and again, saying not, that's not my job is correct. And it's, it's fine. And I'm not, you know, casting aspersions on anyone, you know, for that, but again, seeing it from the student's point of view, this is where we run into these issues, you know, with that. So, um, do you take that in consideration and and reach out or just provide directions over there? Again, I want you don't have to answer, but just something for us to consider. You know, here he is. That's not my office. It's privacy. You know, you got to go talk with that. Uh, with that, so that also will come into play if there is financial aid. You know, or health center, or you know those types of things. But I don't want us just to I, use that as an easy way out by saying, nope, not my stuff, right? Because there are things that we can do, right? There are there are there are connections that we can make in, you know, the the ASAC office, they just hired a bunch of new people, make connections with people, you know, over there so that you can send them a message and say, hey, I'm going to send this student over to you. Are you on campus today? That's another important thing that I want people to remember as we're doing this, because we're still stuck in that old way of just saying, oh, Jean is over in Asbury, go see Jean. And then they get over there, Jean's working from home today, which is great. We don't want that to change. We can do our jobs both places, but don't send students to an office to ask for somebody when they're going to be working remotely. If you can help it, right? Show that we're working together. You know, we're not a 50,000 student school, we're a 13,000 you know, school. We can do some of these things. I know we're all busy and have a lot of stuff on our plate, but those types of things really make a difference in the student experience. If I could add one thing, sometimes a strategy that I'll use sometimes, especially in cases where I'm like worried about overstepping with student information that I do not, like ASAC accommodations that I would not expect that they share with me or have access to otherwise. Um, sometimes if I can't get a hold of, of their contact person, day of to connect them, I'll send that person an email and, and have the student included and say, hey, I'd like to connect you. The student has some concerns about X general general theme here. Um, and then that way the, the, the campus contact can respond directly to the student if it's not information I need to be privy to. Um, and I can use that as kind of a launching point with my next conversation with the student to say, hey, just like to check that you heard back from so-and-so. If not, could I help follow up? Um, again, not asking for the answer or like or the resolution necessarily, but 
to prevent sending the student on on kind of a run around campus, but also help make that a, that, that um, also, connection. That also stops this, it keeps the student from having to repeat the story over again as much as you can. You know, how many times have we had a student show up in our office that says, you know, so-and-so sent me here. Okay, and we get that all the time. And you know, you may get it less so, but it's just like for what? And they don't understand the terms necessarily. And also, as much as we can make that uh, referral easier, right? I'd like to voice a comment from the chat. Okay. Um, so Heidi shared in their group, they talked about uh, providing students with the information about um, Dean of Students Office, DOS for future support, um, but also in connection to any medical conditions that might affect class attendance. Again, depending on the situation. Um, Center for Wellbeing as well, um, as this is likely causing anxiety and stress and impacting the student's well-being. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Next one. All right, let's go to scenario number two. Uh, we do have some ringers at this in this group. So, <laughs> so let's see um, what you all did. What do you what do you do in this situation? Well, we had a couple scenarios, but we weren't sure. Um, and I Thanks for calling us ringers, Judy. Um, <laughs> so it's a first year student that's been told they are missing information and her fall schedule only shows one course. Missing information, I would be, who told you that? And then I would start trying to figure out, does the student claim their account? Um, do they, have they completed their new legal questionnaire? Um, those would be my first thoughts. Um, because they're not going to have necessarily, they will have a registration restriction, but maybe it, it seems like that's not the, the question. Um, that's that's where I started from. Okay. okay. Um, so that's so asking questions, right? Because that could be one of those things. What? Okay. So who told you you have missing information? Did you get an email or something? Try to tease out, you know, what that is. Because that could mean anything. Yeah. So what else? Could not. So we see that word, and she cannot register. Yes. Classes. Yes. Dig deeper. Right? Uh, okay. I've had that conversation. I pull up here and I buy a nice little bit of That is blocking. Yes. Looks fine. And the question now is how? How do I register? Right? What is the direction that I'm going into? So I think something we need here at can just take that for face value. Yes. So you know, it's like their can might just be because they don't know. Mm -hmm. That is such a good point, Ashley. Yeah, so that's what, so you listen to their story and then you do your research, right? Mm -hmm. You do that. So good, good, really good points. Are they adding classes to the spring 2024 calendar in Eagle Service? <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> usually 60% of the issues. So do any of our, you know, Michael or David, um, do you have any, does this ring a bell? Okay, so what what would you do in this situation as far as missing information? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the screenshot that was the follow up. This is a real scenario. The screenshot said missing date of birth or gender. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what. So again, you know, and this is this is missing information that um, we don't see in colleague, right? Mm -hmm. well, unless we're looking to see that information. There's no stop on there. There's nothing that comes up that says that, you know. But when the student registers, that comes up. So that's where they're getting that missing information. Is that's what she shared. We dig deeper and we, the screenshot is great, you know? And the thing is, is when we have students in front of us here, they all have their, their computers with them, their laptops, their phones, let's try to do it together. You know, bring it up and let's see. Oh, okay. Um, so with that information, then what do you do? So we've, we've interacted with them. There's missing um, biographical information. Um, what do you do? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you showed them the demographic change form on the registered website um, for and or technicians and say, is this, is this in their application? How can I give it over? Can you guys make that address? Um, I mean, the department would be able to have that that's on their application that can be verified. Mm -hmm. They just take care of it sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But as a double check, you would have to fill up the application. Okay. Right. So, 
we can take ownership of it, right? This is something that we can, if you can document this missing information, then we can have it updated for you. Yeah, there. Mm -hmm. No? Yeah, so that's what the question is, if a student would have received an email, and this... Yes. That's right. And, yeah, and actually, this was, you know, I brought this up at our meeting last week because this was like a gap in how we're doing, you know, how many students fall into this situation, into this category, that they have missing information on their admissions application. The only way that they know it is when they go log in to try to register and they get that message. We don't communicate with them, you know, with that. So that's, you know, we we need to be more proactive and we will be more proactive next year, you know, with that or every semester to reach out to students who have that particular information missing. Okay. So let's go to scenario number three. Yeah, so we separated it between like our free work before we met with the student and then our rest of the meeting. Yeah. Well, they changed the time. Oh, you changed it. That's so, oh, that's, that's a typo. Okay. Okay. It is a student at AU. <laughs> no, that's yes. okay. It was graduate. I'm, this is a typo. I apologize. Get as many as yeah. So, we looked at was there an academic alert? So, we would check the RN to see if something had been submitted. We would check the RN for any email correspondence with the student, as well as Outlook, which is again. Their outlook don't naturally talk to each other, which means that a hectic time for an advisor just does not a good way to do our mm -hmm. um, We would also reach out to the faculty to see if there's any information they can have for the question not available. Um, then in the meeting, a lot of it really depends on what the said in terms of what happened. Um, Karen and I naturally went to the big thinking about a DOS referral, but then right before we started, I was like, maybe they just found one class and there isn't anything going on. So again, like, was the medical issue specific with COVID for a week? Like, all of that, like, we have to ask all of that to figure out what is the right office. And then again, like, how to frame it for the, for, for the student dependent on what the situation was. Um, we talked about, like, actually pulling if we're on Zoom or even if they're in our office, like pulling up the DOS website, like having them make the appointment on the spot, showing them the availability. Um, so they, again, like they have their next step, asking them, can we reply to your email and copy the student or send an email to the student and copy DOS to kind of give some background. Um, Sarah mentioned that some offices, some advising offices would have done a care report, that's not a capital our office. So again, like curious about that. Um, so my follow-up question, remind me what your name is. Amber. Amber. Okay, so would this answer be different if it was depending on what school or college it was? And assuming the student walks in to SOC. Would this be, would you encourage them to make an appointment for this? And would that answer be different if someone walked into first year advising to do this or walked into COGOD or, or PEPS? Are you saying like they walked in, they don't have an appointment? Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, in our office, our admin coordinator would gather information, would connect with the advisor over Teams. Okay. And see if the advisor can meet with the student. If they cannot, then the coordinator would reach out to Sarah or myself to say, "Here's here's what I've been told. Do I ask them to make an appointment? Do I have to meet with one of you?" And we would just triage and send them on the mm -hmm. on the severity for this. I probably see the student on the day of if we were available. Okay. Sometimes we're just not, and so both. The admin coordinator will make the appointment so that the student has the has the appointment scheduled okay. for later that day or the next day. Okay. Now, what about first year advising? If this was a first year student who walked into your building and said, "I need to see my advisor because I'm dealing with all these issues," what what would we have? To? Yeah, I can speak to that. I guess we have a a, a similar triage esque type. Um, group chat among our, our leadership team that our front desk coordinators or student staff will pop in the chat says hey this student's here AUID here's the nature of their concern um 
and there's always at least one or two of us on campus and so we'll greet the student respond to them in the moment suss out the nature of their concerns and then go from there okay great again just something to consider you know should the you know the ease of or or, or method of making an appointment to speak with an advisor differ you know depending on what school or college it is I mean, again talking about the student experience yeah. uh, with that so you know i'm sure you you know both how accessible are we all, you know, with that as far as, you know, in-person appointments, walk-ins, Zoom appointments, you know, something for us to keep in. All right, let's get to um, our last scenario. So what did you all think about this situation? What do you think? So um, I think on the first question, what was the answer to the student that uh, right? uh, I would just sort of add one are your expectations Sounds like so a lot of internal research, mm -hmm. uh, reaching out to external parties as needed, and then timeline is important depending on what kind of year it's. All right, so we're running short. We're getting up close to um, the end of the time. So I I love you know going back. It looks like I got lots more questions about all these. I'm assuming this case is in service now, right? So that's what. So again, so you can you can communicate with everyone in the university via service now, and then you know, I would go in that whole record of everything. So. I love it that we have this one. Um, but the registrar's office is in charge of the academic certification of the year. But sometimes, if there are educational um, leaders we need to pull and work through your associate dean in your college, and they will lose the hand off the hand of the hand. Everything is kind of waitable when we need to. And we will often go in and do a holistic review. We do this all the time. And it's not just, oh, well, we don't care about that you're academic. That's not it. It's are there other ways that students may have met requirements through transfer courses, through considering the things that we so on the academic side, work through your associate degree college school, and all these other things. Great. 
great. The only thing that's not waivable is you need 120 credits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Those were some, some great suggestions and, and practices that you all use. So I appreciate that much. So for the last couple minutes, we're going to ask um, you all to provide us some um, um, feedback. Um, since we're talking about systems and, you know, yesterday during one of the Spark sessions, they mentioned a dashboard, you know, that is being put together. You know, I'm curious when I heard that, I'm like, okay, what's going to be on this dashboard? We've been asking for a dashboard, you know, for years. You know, if you look at, at like, Holly has a dashboard at times, right? When you bring up every student, that information that's on the top in Kali, we would be considered a dashboard. So what's in there that every time you bring up a student, you see their name, their address, their AUID, their date of birth. You know, what else? What do you want to see in a dashboard? So yeah, so we'll take this information, these suggestions, and as many of us on, in this room, I'm sure, are going to be on workday committees, you know, as we start planning this next phase. I appreciate this first response, just taking it from, we don't want a systems wish list, we want a system wish list. <laughs> Thank you for that. And I know there's some super knowledge up there. Yes, yes. I can, I can share that as well. And I don't know if it's someplace I can see, but I can take a screenshot and show you all the offices. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what happened here. I'm stuck on this. I'll just scroll through. Hmm. <laughs> Everything. Yes. We are AI. And in case you hadn't figured that out right now, we are now actually back in our offices working <laughs> and we are doing this presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is all for a hologram. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Unless you thought I was funny and then this is the real me. So. I can always count on you now. <laughs> all right, let me find these. My page is stuck on this one for some reason. I'm not able to click back to all answers. So does anyone have a, a super inspirational response that you'd like to voice out here to the group? We'll be able to collect these still in the system. So we'll be able to pass on to people that are very involved in workday conversations. <laughs> um, I just got a question in the chat. Will the presentation be emailed to the people who attended today? Is that something? Okay, it'll be posted on the CTRL website and we can absolutely, if, if you can't find it there, we can absolutely send it along to you. That's no problem. Thank you for asking. Okay, we're at time. Two minutes over. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for talking through this with us. We 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 value the opportunity to 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 dig through like some of these stickier questions and and understand. I didn't hadn't really understood ServiceNow until Jean and I started working together on this project. So even to just be able to talk about and hear y'all's perspective um, is something that that I really value. And hopefully, um, and hopefully y'all feel the same. So we would love your feedback if you'd be willing to. Um, I think there are paper paper responses, and if you're online, if you'd be willing to to fill out the form for um, today's session. And I know, again, we're at time, so please don't feel like you have to thank stick around. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.